Welcome to our service of Holy Communion from St. Mary Magdalene, Liminster. Before we begin our service, I have two items of news for you, both of them good. Monica and Ian had a baby boy this week, well to be precise, Monica had a little baby boy, George. Both mother and son are doing well. And also our new curate, Mark, his wife Laura and their two children, Grace and Boaz, moved into the parish on Tuesday. So they're still sorting themselves out and dealing with the last of the unpacking. We will remember all of them in our prayers and give thanks to God for them. We come to meet with God this morning to offer our prayer, our praise and our adoration to remember Jesus' death for us on the cross and his great love for us. James wrote in his letter that the prayer of a righteous person has great power. And so we pray that we will go away from our time of worship here, strengthened and invigorated by God's Holy Spirit to show his love to the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Our first hymn takes up that theme of God's love for us. O worship the King, all glorious above. And at the end of the service we commit ourselves to God as we sing that great Welsh hymn, Guide us, O thou great Redeemer. with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. 
So remembering that in heaven Jesus presents our case for us, let us call to mind those times when we have displeased our Heavenly Father, ignored his commandments and asked for his forgiveness. And so we pray together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the Collect for the fourth Sunday in Trinity. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that finally we lose not our hold on things eternal. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. We listen now to our lesson from James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man of a nature like ours, and he prayed for virtually that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruits. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back. Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Today's Gospel is written in Matthew chapter 11. In it, Jesus compares himself with John the Baptist, both of whom were criticized by the Pharisees, albeit for their different behavior. And this passage ends with a prayer, which sounds almost as if it should have come from John's Gospel, not from Matthew. It's an insight into the way Jesus prayed to his Heavenly Father. And the chapter ends with a very, very famous appeal to Jesus' disciples. Jesus said, But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, but you would not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. And at that time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. 
Yea, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for yourselves, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Heavenly Father, would you help us all to hear your voice as you speak from your word, I pray, and have hearts that are ready to hear what it is that you would say to us. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I imagine when you were little, when you were younger, that there was someone that you always went to if you got into trouble. Maybe you fell over and hurt yourself. And when you're really little, it's often mummy or daddy or whoever it is that's looking after us or around. And you know that it's them because it's almost instinctive, isn't it? You can't choose. You just fall over, scrape your knee, uh, and you need to run to somebody. So you run to that person that you trust and love the most to look after you. And maybe actually it's not just when you're little. Maybe as you grow older as well, your parents or those you kind of just look to, the ones you really go to, it might still be the same people. It might be new people. Um, Sometimes it feels like you're a bit distant from them. And sometimes, even as adults, it can feel sad to know that we're not as close to those people as we used to be, at least in terms of proximity. We might feel as close to them, but it's not as easy to go to them. Maybe one of the reasons why lockdown has been so hard for people has been that we haven't been able to go to those people that we would normally go to, the people we talk to, the people we can share both the things that we're looking forward to, but also the things that we're worried about with. And not being able to have that person there to go to and talk to It just makes life that much harder. Well, I think that James is wrapping up his letter by checking that Christians, followers of Jesus, know who it is that we can go to, who it is that we must go to if we're to follow him through life. Let me read the first few verses again of that passage from chapter 5. Is any of you in trouble? They should pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is any of you sick? You should call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Do you see how in all those situations, James is calling people to go to the Lord, to be the one that we go to, the one we turn to, the one that we instinctively run to in all those situations. And they're not just bad situations. Yeah, he talks about being in trouble and he talks about when we're sick, but he also writes about when we're happy. And I love that James finishes this letter by sort of encompassing all of emotions from our happiest times to our hardest times within this sense of making sure that it's Jesus that we go to above all else, above anybody else. The God who made us and the God who loved us is there and available for us to go to good times, bad times and everything in between. Are you troubled? Are you happy? Are you sick? Go to Jesus. And the focus is on both the physical and the spiritual. You know, when you're a child, you fall over and graze your knee, you go to your parents for physical healing, which might look like one of those painful things that they put on, but you know really that it's for your good. But also if you're sad or worried or there's something emotional, difficult going on, and you go to them and give them a hug, because they're the one that's going to love you. Well, at the end of James, as he's talked about the wisdom for living a life, following Jesus, he wants to finish by reminding us that everything physical, everything spiritual, everything emotional, everything about us, we can go to this wonderful God who knows us and loves us and is there for us, ready to give us what we need. Now, of course, a big part of this is about going to Jesus for physical healing, and it is one of the clearest passages in the New Testament about what we should do when somebody is sick. You can't avoid it, you can't skip over it, If you're somebody that actually finds some of the more um, supernatural or or miraculous aspects of faith harder, then you need to pay attention to this and not simply put it to one side. This is part of God's word, that we should pray in faith for God to bring healing now, just as he did in the time of Jesus. His power is still at work in the world. 
But we also need to see this verse in the context of the whole passage, the whole thrust of scripture, where it's heading. You can't simply lift it out uh, and ignore everything else that goes on. There's a very strong call to pray here for those who are sick. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do other things. If you've got a headache, take an aspirin or a paracetamol, but also pray. And we shouldn't say that if someone is not healed after a prayer of faith is prayed or not healed immediately, that something is wrong with them or with us as we pray. We all know too many scenarios where actually God's will for that person is to bring them into the final healing of being with him in the new creation. I had that happen this week with somebody who I didn't know. I was called to ask to go and pray and I anointed them and another minister had come as well and done the same. And their families were all Christians, wonderful, faithful Christians who'd been praying for healing and yet that person passed away this week. She didn't pass away, they went on to be with Jesus. We've got to get this right. We've got to understand and not swing so far out of fear that we, we don't pray for anybody to be healed. But likewise, we pray with faith and trust, believing that God can and does bring healing, but he does it to bring glory to his name, not to bring glory to the, the healer. There's nothing special in the, in the elements that are used on their own. The oil in itself is not enough. The, the elders themselves are not the ones where the power resides. It's Jesus that we must go to. He is the one who is able. Sometimes he does that in this life as a sign of his glory. We should believe and trust for that. And sometimes and ultimately for us all, it will be through death that he brings us into a new life. As the Bible moves on to Revelation and speaks of that new creation free from sickness and death. It would be cruel of God to keep us in this life forever when that wonderful eternal life is awaiting all those who are in Jesus. So we've got to get this right, this passage. We should pray and we should pray in faith and believe that God can heal. But we see it in the passage of scripture and the promises of Christ that ultimately take us on through this life to be with him forever. I was talking to another person this week who's had more than their fair share of physical challenges and ailments. They've prayed and they've known some things be healed miraculously. And they've prayed and they've known other things that haven't been. But they said through it all they could see how God was at work. Just like Paul with a thorn in his flesh could see how God was going to use that to bring others to know him. So we pray with faith, we go to Jesus. That's what James is saying. Go to Jesus when you are physically sick or when your friends are physically sick. Use this way of going to him through prayer, but also look to him and his final promise. One day we really will go to him and see him face to face. But there's also a spiritual need to go to Jesus. Did you notice that woven into this is also this question of the need for forgiveness? If someone has sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. Physical and spiritual. The most important thing for any of us and all of us is that our sins are forgiven and we can be with Jesus now and forever. It's the biggest issue that affects us. The sin in our hearts which cuts us off from God and which deserves death and will lead to death if nothing is done about it. And we can try all sorts of things to make ourselves good people and sort of imagine that God is at the top of a mountain to crawl our way back up to him through our, our good deeds and our, our religious observance and all those sorts of things. But actually, dead people can't bring themselves to life again. We need the Holy Spirit to come in and give us the life of Jesus. And so the call of James is to go to Jesus for our spiritual healing as well as our physical. To confess our sins, to acknowledge that we've turned away from God, but then to receive this gift of life and love and forgiveness and welcome and a power to change. That's where James finishes as well, isn't it? That if any of us wander from the truth and someone brings us back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. True and final spiritual healing is also when we go to Jesus, saved from death into life. Who do we go to? Who do we run to? I've said it before, but my favorite picture that Jesus paints of what God is like is of the father in the story of the prodigal son. 
son who had turned his back said, I, I'd rather you were dead and I had my inheritance now. I'm going to go and live my life my way. A picture of all of us in our hearts at one time. As the younger son runs back up the dusty path, he sees his father not cross, not about to say, I told you so, but running. For all his faults and failings, the younger son knew that the one he had to go to was the father who might love him. And he found him there. Who do we go to? Who will you go to tomorrow when the first challenge of the day arises? Who will you go to this week when something really good happens and you see someone for the first time or you hear some good news? Who will you go to? Who do you go to each morning as you wake up and think about the day that lies ahead of you? Who do you go to for those big things in life when you're wondering what the future might hold? James says, go to Jesus for everything and you will find him there. And so Heavenly Father, we do thank you for that amazing grace. We pray, Lord, now for that grace to fill our hearts. As we've heard throughout this letter of James, what it looks like to put our faith into action, we pray for your grace to enable us to do that and that we would do it gracefully. That as we seek to live and to speak and to pray and to trust in you, we would do that, Lord, knowing that it's because of your grace that we can know you. We can have your presence with us, giving us the power to be able to do it, but also giving us the pleasure of knowing that we can live for you, the God who made us and has a great purpose for us and for your creation. Lord, as your followers, would you give us the strength to follow you, the desire to walk closer with you each day and to know what it means to put our faith in you into practice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our communities, for the people around us, the shops and businesses and other areas of life that are opening up this weekend. Pray, of course, for safety. We pray also, Lord, that all that's been going on might prompt those questions in people's minds. What is it I put my security in in this world? Am I really in control of my own future? Is there a God who made us and who is calling us back to him and the promise of a new world free from sickness and death? Lord, we pray for those in our community who are lonely, who are suffering, who are mourning, for those who still can't go out easily, for those who've never been able to go out easily, for our schools, for those who have lost income, whose jobs are insecure, for those who just have those troubles of the day, And Lord, we pray for each one of us that we would know the words of James, that we can go to you in our troubles and in our joys. We pray not just for ourselves, Lord, but for the people around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Heavenly Father, we do lift your world to you. We thank you for this good world that you've made, a beautiful creation, and yet one that is broken and spoiled. For our part in that, for the way that our actions as stewards over your world, have damaged this world and the relationships within it and with you. We see that working out day after day, year after year. And yet, Lord, through it all is this promise that the end of the story is good news. And so we pray, Lord, that your grace would flood our world, that it would fill it with the light and the hope and the joy of Jesus Christ. And that your people, scattered throughout the globe, dispersed amongst the nations, would be those who speak and live the good news of Jesus Christ in practice, in word and deed, to those around. Make us hopeful, joyful people who go to you in every time of life and point this whole world to the source of our hope and our salvation. For all those who are really struggling around the world today, for all those situations both in our news and fallen away from it, Lord, we lift it to you and trust in your amazing grace. 
And so we bring these prayers together in the words of the prayer that you yourself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We come now to the peace. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit we were all baptised into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life between us. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We begin now the Eucharistic prayer and as has become our custom, when it comes to the moment of reception, as I take the bread and wine, I will pray a short prayer so that you at home may be able to make your spiritual communion and unite yourselves with Christ along with me. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, we give you thanks through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh, born of the Blessed Virgin. He lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself, made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom. And with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. And so we proclaim, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, 
in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. And so let us pray with confidence for the coming of God's kingdom in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Jesus is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. A prayer for those at home. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you are present now by your Spirit. Since I cannot receive the bread and the wine, I pray that you will come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you. Let nothing ever separate me from you. May I live and die in your love. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen.
Next week there will be an online service as there has been for the last few weeks here from Livingston, but we'll also be starting our weekly services back here in church on Sunday morning. We don't quite know what time yet, we're having to liaise with Celia as we share um, an organist, but I will be in touch with all of you and let you know what the time is. I know how many of you have said how glad you will be to be back here in church. The service will be quite quiet, thoughtful, reflective. It will be a service of Holy Communion, but a relatively short one. We're not allowed to sing and there won't be any tea or coffee afterwards. But well, at least not here in church, we may be able to go on somewhere. But at the same time, we're also conscious that not all of you is able to come back to church or not all of you feel it's quite safe to do so yet. We don't want you to feel left out in any way, and so the online services will continue as before. Let's commit ourselves and one another to God's care and protection. God the Father, by whose glory Christ was raised from the dead, strengthen you to walk with him in his risen life, and the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and those whom you love, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.